What's your story? How do you get it out to the public? How do you get it out to the public year after year after year? How do you keep telling a story? That's what we're going to talk about with our story expert, Reba, tonight. It's a really fun, very interesting episode that definitely got my gears turning. Hope it gets yours turning as well. Before we get started, of course, I want to shout out Float Helm. Uh, Float Helm has another new feature that is super cool. Of course, all their new features are super cool. This one is for insurance billing, actually. Um, it's only for pre- t- practitioners, so like your, your LMTs, your massage therapists who have a license number. You could turn on receipts for insurance billing, which is super cool. So your clients can get a receipt that they can use to reimburse for insurance. Super convenient feature for clients who would like that. And, you know, it's not all of them, but when it does happen, it's really convenient and really cool. So that's just one more feature Float Helm is putting out for us that we can use for our clients and for the ease of use outside of client scheduling, employee scheduling, logbook, task management, all that other stuff is baked in as well. But they continue adding these really cool features. So check them out at helmbot.com. Don't take my word for it. Take a free tour, have them walk you through everything and make sure it's a good fit for you. Also, Isopod, I-S-O-P-O-D.com, is where you want to go to check out Isopod float tanks. We have two at the float shop. We absolutely love them. They're built like a beast. I say that every time, and I think I will every time, too, uh, because they're just built so damn well. The parts that they use, the stainless steel, everything is heavy. It has weight to it. It lasts. Quality parts, quality technology. The uh, fiberglassing is done very well. You're never going to find bubbles on an isopod float tank. You're never going to find that bubbling that can occur when people don't know how to expertly do fiberglassing. It's a complicated process. It, it requires mastery to do it right, and that's what isopod does. Um, I've also had issues mm, for any issues that have come up with my isopods. Uh, their customer service has been great. I've been able to get a hold of them and get parts shipped to me extremely quickly. I don't even understand how quickly the parts get from the UK to here so quickly, but hey, it happens, so I'm not asking any questions. Again, isopod, I-S-O-P-O-D.com. Check them out, and let's start the show. Welcome back to another episode of Art of the Float, where float setters thrive. My name is Dylan. I own the float shop in Portland, Oregon with my beautiful wife, Sandra. And we used to tell our story and it used to be really integrated with our email, like our relationship and starting the float center. All of that was all kind of baked into our story. Now it's saved for about two little paragraphs on our website. When you look in the about us field, it's not told in our social media anymore. Um, And um, yeah, that's where we're at. Hey, it's Kim Hannon. I co-own Sukino Float Center in Salt Cave in Southern Indiana with my husband, Graham. And um, sort of like Dylan, like we told a lot of our story in the beginning, we still sprinkle it in in little bits here and there um, and really try to use that to connect. But right now we're also focusing on sharing the stories of our new team members and um, kind of how they come into the business. That's awesome, Kim. I wish I was doing more of that as well. This is Drew from New Hampshire Float, and I don't tell my story at all. I know I should. (laughs) Um, I don't tell much about myself personally. I don't even have an about me on my website. Mm. And I think when I first opened, I started doing that stuff and then kind of got away from it. But I look forward to, and I'm pretty sure it's important to tell the story. So I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion. Perfect. Well, I think you're in luck because we have somebody I'm so delighted to have met through a a photo shoot, actually. So (laughs) actually, uh, for anybody who signed up, this is coming out a week late, so you can't sign up now, but they'll be on sale um, about a month or two from now. But Reba was a float model and we just started talking and Reba is an absolutely fascinating, intelligent person and is great at storytelling. In fact, that is what she has been doing for I mean, I'm sure it's over 10 years, but for 10 years now, she's been hosting a show called Mystery Box, and I think we should talk about that for a minute. Reba, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Yay. Tell us about Mystery Box, how you got started with that, and and what it's become, and also what it's led to. Yeah, well, the Mystery Box show is um, it's a storytelling show where we feature real people who are telling true stories about their lives. And our particular show, all the 
all the stories are about sex, um, which actually is, is cool, but doesn't matter um, in the context of the storytelling, because really the show is just about great storytelling and the thing that gets people in the door is the sex. Well, I got to say, Drew's face just got three times larger. <laughs> <laughs> you have my Come attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What kind of stories are we telling uh, here? Sex stories, my friend. <laughs> Well, and which actually ties into storytelling itself is that, um, you know, a lot of times we'll have people in the audience who are very vanilla or even asexuals or like my mom will be there and the stories are all relatable. Somebody could get on stage and tell a story about being in a threesome in a dungeon on a St. Andrew's cross and you might be like, what are these words coming out of your mouth? I don't even know what you're talking about but the story will still be relatable because of the emotions that are conveyed and the connectivity that we help coach into the storytellers so that it relates to the audience so you can feel connected even if you've never had that same lived experience. And that's really what storytelling, no matter what the topic is. But just don't associate my name with that story tonight, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, and I think, so when we were, when we were talking, I, I think I had the same reaction as Drew, like just kind of like the wow and and curious about it and interested but i have to say as reba kept talking about it 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 really she really did show me that that is the hook the the hook of interest the hook of vulnerability but then uh, she really gets the story aspect of it and would you mind um also sharing what you shared with me about how um I don't know if coaching is the right word, but how, mm-hmm. how the people who are going to go up on stage are, are coached or whatever term you would use. Yeah, we do use the, word, the term coaching. So people pitch two or three sentences of a story to us, just a quick elevator pitch over email. Um, and we sort of know based on that, can that be coached or expanded upon? Um, and then we meet with them for about an hour. They tell us their story. We don't interrupt them. We just, just conversationally, we don't like them to have it written down and reading because we read very differently than we speak. Mm-hmm. And ultimately it's oral storytelling. So, um, but it can be of, of course transcribed if that story needs to go somewhere in a written form. But um, uh, we take notes and then we start asking them questions like uh, points of clarification or specific details. And we help them form a story arc a lot of times people, if it's your life, if it's your personal narrative, it can be really difficult to like put it into a succinct, focused story. And so having an outside coach there is really beneficial for that piece of it. Um, so we give them notes and then we meet up again, uh, maybe a week or two later and hear their story again with those notes incorporated into it. And that happens maybe two or three times. And then we'll have a, a rehearsal with all the storytellers there so they can all hear and see each other's stories. And then... Then we hop up on stage. So they're they're pretty well confident with what they're going to say at that point, and and you are confident that it's going to be a quality story at that point. Well, yeah, I mean, it's got our name on it, so nice. yeah, <laughs> right. You know, you don't want to, and you know, and we always tell people that I think the thing people get nervous most about is if they're telling a story for a live audience. What if I forget my story? It's not written down. It's not a memorized monologue. What yeah. if I forget? And we always say, you know, memorize the beats, but it's your story. It happened to you. It's your personal narrative. You know exactly what your story is. So you're not really forgetting. You've probably told it a million times to friends or, or whatever. So, or it's replayed in your head, you know, time and time again. So you know your story. Nice. Just as somebody who uh, hates being on stage, it's incredibly painful. Do, are there people who are worried about freezing on stage? who do, or does everybody end up having success telling telling their story? I think only twice in 10 years has Mm. anybody frozen on stage. Okay. And honestly, most, I'll speak for my audience, but I'd say most audiences who are watching a live personal narrative are going to be very supportive. Like they know that you're being vulnerable. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to have a bunch of jerks in the audience (laughs) being like, yeah, I'm so glad you failed. Um, (laughs) <laughs> no hecklers, yeah. No, yeah. no. Yeah, it's, it's a supported uh, medium, I feel like. And uh, at 10 years, actually, you just had your final show <laughs> yeah. two nights ago. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, how did you decide to, to put a pin in 10 years of work? Um, well, when the pandemic hit, we couldn't perform. Sure. Um, 
and we actually decided to do live streams for a year, which was actually cool because then we could feature storytellers from all over the world mm-hmm. um, and, and people in other countries could watch and things like that, which was awesome. Um, but it's just, it's a lot of work. Uh, my husband and I run it essentially by ourselves. We have a production assistant who helps day of, but we do all of mm. the coaching, the producing, the hosting. I tell a story at every show, so I'm also performing. We uh, oh, do all of the marketing ourselves. We do all of the procuring of the sponsors. We do all the social media, um, you know, the, 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 e- what's it called? The mail, <laughs> the mail newsletter that goes out newsletter. The, 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 the <laughs> See, my mail. brain yeah. is fried. <laughs> my brain because, is fried after. Cause you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. We, we totally understand. You get it. You get <laughs> yep. it. You get it. Um, yeah. And we were just, you know, the second year of the pandemic, I was like, what would happen if we just took a little break? Let's just see what happens. Like the stakes are pretty low right now. Everybody's mm-hmm. taking breaks and mm-hmm. not doing stuff. And it was just, um, we started to like each other more. <laughs> not just business partners. <laughs> nice. Right. Yeah. I mean, I should say that too. I'm, well, you're married to your business partner, right? Indeed. So, yes. Uh, <laughs> same, and same we, used Kim, to, yeah. Yeah, we used to joke like our, you know, are we only in a good marriage because we work together? Like what would happen mm. if we didn't have the show? Would we mm-hmm. still like each other? Because we've <laughs> always, we've never been together not doing the show. Oh, interesting. We started out doing it together. Okay. Um, yeah. And we just, it, we, I don't know, we kind of talked it over and, and discussed that honestly, the things that I personally love most about the show is the coaching. And I love the connection, but I love story coaching. Um, and I don't, have to have a show about sex, if that makes sense. Um, that's not ever what it was for me. And I can still do coaching in so many different ways. Drew had sad eyes there. He, he yeah, I said, I would have said it could always but, be about sex. But <laughs> it's, it's not all about the sex. So we'll, we'll post Just the most. YouTube link so we, you can, you can research and find all the, all the this stories. Will be our yeah. highest watched YouTube yeah. episode. Yeah. No, it's youtube.com slash mystery box show. We have over 250 sex stories up there, including a couple of my, mo- of my own. Not all of mine are up there because I don't want my mom to see them. But <laughs> So this um, might be a, a good time to um, kind of transition and talk about What makes a good story? What are things that people should highlight? And even though we might be float center owners talking about float centers and it might not be as interesting as telling our sexual stories, (laughs) but um, what, what should people who maybe not be as extroverted or um, might struggle with trying to put together their story? How do you decide what is like important to share or interesting even because I'm sure there's a lot of self doubt and, um, you know, just kind of self defeating attitude of like, Oh, that wouldn't be interesting. People don't want to know about that when in fact it might be really interesting. So how, Mm. what are some like tips that you might share with people to help with that? That's a really great question. Um, and I teach a 90 minute workshop where I offer those prompts when people are trying to, so I should send mm. you that list of prompts. I don't have it on me, but I should, um, Is it so okay if we post, co- post what yeah, absolutely, are? absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things. So first of all, we're looking for emotional stakes. Are you all familiar with, um, David Sedaris? He's an essayist, no. an amazing essayist. So funny. <laughs> Well, he writes about like the most mundane topics ever, Hmm. but they're the funniest things you've ever read Hmm. Um, because he's talking, he's writing about emotions that we can all relate to. Mm -hmm. So I give an example in my workshop of when I was in eighth grade, um, I had to have a pair of guest jeans or I thought I was going to die. And you might be like, so what you wanted a pair of guest jeans, who cares? Like, that's not a very exciting, that's not like I climbed Mount Everest. And so why would I tell a story about guest jeans? Well, I'm telling the story about guest jeans because I thought that I could be popular. I was a theater kid. I didn't have many friends. And I thought the popular kids are wearing those guest jeans. If I get the guest jeans, I'm going to be popular. And then I'm going to have a boyfriend and I'm going to be on the cheerleading squad. And I'm going to have all, those are high emotional stakes for me. And then I go on to talk about like, but they cost $80. Now, what mischief am I going to get into to be able to get that $80 to get these Mm. guest jeans? And suddenly 
the audience might go, oh, I've been in a situation where I wanted something because I thought it would get me something else. Oh, I've been in a situation where <clears throat> I needed to raise money for something that was really important to me. So we're talking about the emotional stakes there, if that makes sense. Um, but let me see if I can think about some of the prompts would be like um, a time that uh, a race against the clock is a really good one. Um, stakes in general, when I say emotional stakes, does that make sense? Do you know what I mean when I say stakes? Yeah, there's something to be lost, something to be had. There's, there are stakes. Yeah, exactly. And that's the difference between an anecdote and a story. An anecdote, you might hmm. be like, I was late to work today. And you might go, huh? <laughs> right? <laughs> or you could say, I was late to work today because there was a, um, a, a circus of unicyclists causing all this traffic. And then there was an accident. And suddenly you're like, whoa, tell me more. Um, and the stakes are now kind of like, well, what? And then what? What happens next? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's just one part of it, Drew. And then also, as far as like, if, if I were a float shop owner, I would want as much, I would want to build a sense of community. And people like to know who you are, not just like who you are in your bio, but like also why you are, like the why yeah. behind it. And I think um, when I've worked with other people for marketing purposes and they're just kind of struggling, they kind of give an about section of what they think their niche clientele wants to hear mm. instead of just being honest about and then letting someone observe them and go, oh, I wonder if I can see myself in that at all. Because we have no idea the ways that we're connecting with other people. We have no idea if our experience we think our experience has to relate to them like specifically directly, but they know their own life and they know how it can relate to them or spark something in them through like a roundabout way. So if we just tell our story and be true to ourselves in that regard, other people will reflect on it. Does hmm. that make sense? That what makes up for, that makes sense. Sorry, guys. Dylan. Well, what comes up for me when you say that <clears throat> is talking about my origin story of, of working in a nine to five <clears throat> cubicle at a fortune 500 company, whereas just this little cog in the machine and, and how floating helped me escape that. Would that be closer to what you're talking about? Because that, that's the authentic story, even though I don't necessarily think that's why my clientele, maybe some of my clientele, but not all of my clientele is floating for. Yeah, I think absolutely. Cause that also relates to um, somebody taking just any path that they thought they were supposed to and discovering mm. something else that led them in another direction. That can relate to a million different people's stories. And suddenly I feel closer to you, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. in the float world, I feel like everybody has that story because everybody was doing something else, floated for the first time and thought, oh, I think I want to do that. And it seems like, I, th I feel like that's a good opportunity for everybody listening out there to tell that story, even if you think you were just, you know, oh, I was at a nine to five, maybe tell what you were feeling during that time and sharing what you were going through during that time, especially now. I feel like that's really relatable with all the change that's going on in the world where um, Kim, Dylan, myself, we were all doing something else that we were um, maybe classically trained for, for lack of better terms, and ended up doing this unique thing and there's a story behind that. There's a motivation behind that. There's emotion behind why we all chose to leave behind and venture off into this wild, unknown path. So I, I do think that could be interesting stories to the general public, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I think it, it, it goes even bigger than just having this, like, one single story to tell. It's little snippets that you're dropping in, you know, in your organic social posts. It's... You know, I deal with anxiety and here's my story and here's how uh, floating helps with that. And it's not just like why you got into floating, but it's like mm -hmm. it's relating as a human and not as a business trying to sell something. And I think that's what really, really makes it 
click with people when they read something, you know, and like I'm dealing with major allergies right now. And whenever I post about halo therapy, my salt cave, I'm talking about how much it helps me personally. And I'll tell people like, please don't come because I want the cave to myself, you know, and, and they think that's funny. It's relatable. They're like, yes, I love it when I have it too. And, but it's me using the service as a human, not just saying here are all of the benefits, which we need to put all that information out there, but to be able to also share here I am as a real person um, and here's how this service helps me or here's, you know, the life that I have. It can be about your products that you're selling and your story can come across in so many little bitty snippets too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's important. And I think, Drew, you said something key there um, regarding what you were doing at your nine to fives, et cetera. Um, it's always good to have context of who you were before and then the contrast of who you are now as a result of this uh, thing that you are marketing. Hmm. Like the thing being That's floating, the full I arc, suppose. the hero's yeah. journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's one way. I don't technically use the hero's journey, but it is a good place to start. Lots of people are familiar with it. Sure. Um, so I, I don't personally share a lot about myself on my social media, but when I'm in my shop and I have my hair down and I'm like, yeah, cool, chilling. And people start asking questions when they find out I was a probation officer that shaved my head and wore a suit to work and was very like, you can't do this. They're like, no way. I don't see it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm chilling now. But they're <laughs> always, there's always a reaction to that. And I wish I was more comfortable at like putting that out there, but there's definitely a discomfort that I have about sharing stuff like that, that prevents me from telling more of the story. Yeah. Yeah. When I'm, I'm there to like work on the tanks or whatever, and then it'll even pop in my head like, oh, I could be sharing about this. And then I kind of get cold feet or like, oh, maybe I'm not dressed well enough for it or what have you. I have these things that stop me. Do you have any, I don't know, encouragement or ideas on how to approach that? Well, I think it depends on if you actually want to do it or not. It sounds like Dylan, you want to do it, but you're stopping yourself from Dylan. Yeah. And Drew, you just don't want to do it. And I think that's. Wow. And I think. Nailed it. You know. <laughs> right. And so there are two different answers there. I think if you just don't want to do it, that's okay because there are, like Kim said, other avenues of telling your story mm. in little snippets. And also, like I, I can't speak for uh, Drew and Kim, but I know Dylan, you do. Um, testimonials, other people telling their stories regarding your business. And that's another very effective way to do it. So yeah, you don't Mm. have to do it yourself. Um, But I would say, Dylan, to just, um, I say this in a loving way, um, (laughs) but just get over yourself. (laughs) Like, <laughs> but I'm so and I, important. And, Are you kidding oh, me? But, no. And, and, and I mean this by like, um, you know, we met because I modeled for you. I do modeling, but the posts that I get the most attention from are the ones where I'm sitting on the couch with no makeup and my glasses and my cat, because people are like, Oh, you're a real person that I relate mm-hmm. to. Mm-hmm. So if you're like, I can't go on camera right now, I'm wearing my worst t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I say that that's, <laughs> Okay, okay. And sometimes even better. Yeah. I've gone live, like after I got soaked cleaning the shower and accidentally hit the the knob the wrong way and got absolutely drenched. And I went live and I was like, you guys, like, (laughs) here's what just happened. But you know what? I don't care because people are about to come in and float. And like, those are fun. And and Mm, it's that behind the scenes. People get to see like what you're really like. Right. And that feels like a big deal. And I... I say this, this comes up a lot in coaching with inhibitions. Um, It's a phrase that I just kind of live by. And again, I say this in a loving, kind way. People aren't thinking about you as much as you think they're thinking about you. (laughs) Totally. So, you know, if you're like, oh, my hair is doing this thing, they're not, they don't even see it. Most people don't even see it. They're seeing whatever it is that relates to them because they're thinking about themselves. You're thinking about, you're worried about you and what's going on. They're thinking about them and how can this benefit me? Totally. Yeah. That's great. That, that, <clears throat> that always helps me. And sometimes I feel like my anxiety is 
strictly related to my ego, which is such a gross idea, but it is like, wait, why am I so important that I'd be embarrassed to put myself out there because I care too much about myself or my self-image is, uh, is, is kind of yucky. Um, but, it, but I, I feel like they're attached. Yeah. Well, I feel like that's human first of all. Sure. For sure. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and we, we all have, have this. Yeah, we all but let's be honest, humans are perfection. pretty disgusting. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and yep. it's we're all super perfection. We're all super gross and we all love to hear about each other's grossness. So, <laughs> so, uh, so that might even lead to my next question, which is about, so like there's, there's the start of how the float center started. And, and like Drew says, we all have this really compelling start, but the shop is 10 years in and, and even I could refresh, you know, every few months or once a year on, on kind of the origin story, um, for the Ziz Shafi, but how do I, um, how do I continually tell a story over time for my business? When you go out to dinner or drinks with friends and they say, how's business? What do you say to them? Uh, <laughs> uh, geez, going out with friends. Sorry, that, that you caught me right there. <laughs> imagine. I, I, too, just too imagine. Kids when, COVID. <laughs> when you Zoom, <laughs> when you Zoom yeah. with friends. Yeah. <laughs> It's the conversations we have before we start recording. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry. They, they say, how's business? Yeah. What do you say to them? If you're not like, Ugh, all these negative problems. If you have things that genuinely are like awesome at the moment or like satisfying. Cool. What do you yeah. Say to like them? There, there are cool client story. Oh, man, shit, shoot. Uh, yeah. There's cool client stories I might want to tell. Um, there is uh, like memberships, like when I'm talking to my buddies, I'm talking about wanting to increase our number of memberships. Um, but I don't know if that would be something now, technically it does affect my clients because I want them to become my members, but I'm not sure how that fits into a, a story, but, um, yeah. And sometimes silly sto- uh, stories. Why am I, why am I using the word story over and over, but silly stories, uh, from the shop as well. Um, or like, Oh my gosh, now I just feel like I have all these things. What a great prompt Reba. Um, <laughs> like we had this super cool t-shirt that, um, I'm, we had made like eight years ago and we really never did anything with. And, and, uh, we pulled that out, um, photoshopped out the, the wiener. So it's PG rated PG and you can wear it publicly. And now it's this really cool old, like, uh, sixties, uh, comic style art float shop shirt, which is super cool. So like, that's what I would be telling my friends about potentially boring them about, but stuff that I'm excited about. (laughs) Yeah. So I don't want to say that all of your clients want to be your friend, but sort of like, Clients want to feel com- that that comfort zone and like you could be a friend. You know, they're not sure. trying to necessarily be your friend. Mm-hmm. But so I think stories like that, because they're important to you and it's interesting and it's just, oh, that's a cool thing that you might not have expected to hear from a float shop because I'm expecting to just hear you sell to me, sell to me, sell to me. And I think, again, people reflect if they hear something else that's not just sell, 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 although I know you have to sell as well. But if they're hearing something different, then they can take that in and self-reflect and be like, I would like to be associated with that. And then that, hmm. that in itself is a form of selling. Right. By just Interesting. I have a question on top on of that. You. Dylan, do you tell, do you share your photography with the float shop and float shop customers? Or is that just an industry thing? Do I share it with them? What do you mean? Yeah. like, like Does uh, the float shop use the images? But you're not showing them behind the scenes stuff like you do for us, right? Oh, no, no. Yeah, that's very separate. Yeah, I, I do keep them pretty separate. But that's a yeah. major part of your life now, right? When we ask you, yeah. I find you talking a lot more about photography than, you know, things going at the shop if I, from a third party. So yeah. maybe yeah. that could be something you could share with people, the other things that you do. That's a great point. I, I've never even thought about crossing the streams, as it were. Yeah, like why? And I feel like I could get more regular people in from the shop too if they saw what it was like and saw that oh, this is actually like a relaxed, cool thing. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. That's actually the biggest question people ask me. There, if I talk about float shops, they're like, "What is it?" <laughs> oh, funny, and then right. having to like describe it and then I'll be like, well, you know, it's like a, it's like a pot of salty water <laughs> and they're like, what do you talk? What do you mean? Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Like showing, showing what, what's going on in there. Yeah. yeah and sharing your story about the, how you're involved in the industry of, you know, this podcast. Um, it's really fascinating that, um, 
we actually have a couple of guests who have found the podcast and they're like, Hey, you're like, that was the thing. Cause people want to know if they're really, really anxious about floating, they start diving in, trying to figure out what it is. Why do I do it? All of this. And somebody went down this whole like breadcrumb trail and found the podcast and they, they were like, that's really cool that like you were on a podcast talking about floating to help other float centers. And that was, <laughs> he trusted us more because oh, of the position right, right. here and to be able to, to talk about it, you know, and to help other centers. And so, I mean, you have so many layers of your story and that all is, you know, why people can trust you and why they like you. And, you know, they might hear something that you say even on here and just have that sense of relatability that it's not just a business for us, you know, mm. like, yeah, we talk a lot of business, but there's so much more to it. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. I, I want I want more prompt ideas. I feel like I I've already got a few good, <laughs> but maybe maybe not just prompts. What else am I missing? Like what are the the key components? Because you even had um, there was there was the prompt, there were the stakes, and then was there a resolution part too that was important? Like it, it does it need to land somewhere? You don't want to just leave them hanging. Yeah, I mean I didn't mention that, but um, yeah, you don't want to just leave them hanging. I mean I <clears throat> I can't speak for all of you, but it seems like the resolution or the end is that now you have this float shop. Sure. Um, for, for that particularly, particular for, bit. Yeah. Right. For that. Yeah. Um, my favorite trick is, uh, cause the ending is always the hardest part, especially if it's a personal narrative cause your life isn't over. So right. how could your story possibly be over? Right. Um, is going back to the beginning and seeing how you started it. Like your first line, how did you start that? And how does that connect to the end? Cause by the time you get to the end, a lot of times you've kind of forgotten where you started. Sure. And so coming back there helps it go full circle and just see, nice. like, how does this relate or does it relate? Or, um, uh, you know, now I don't even think about that nine to five unless I've, I don't know, unless I'm falling asleep dreaming about the life I don't have anymore happily or whatever. That was totally a, good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, that was totally a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you didn't give me enough time to, like, think of something good. Um but yeah, I always like going to the beginning and seeing like, okay, now how cool. does this relate to the end? And how do I sort of, you don't have to tie it up in a neat little bow. In fact, a lot of people can see past that and be like, that's big Cheeseville. Oh, uh-huh. Cheeseville, not Hamville, totally different. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then they don't trust you if you're cheesy. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I hate cheese, so, yeah. Yeah, so just finding a way to be authentic and clever. Humor always sells... Not that something has to be funny, but if you're uh, vulnerable enough to let your guard down, things usually do get funny. Hmm. Okay. I dig it. Uh, what are you do? You said that you're teaching classes now on storytelling. Who finds you and what does the class look like? Why, why are they going to you for what? Mm-hmm. Good. Thank you. Well, thank you for asking. Um, well, I'm not currently <laughs> teaching classes. I'll occasionally, and I'm transitioning into coaching more. We just ended our show, as you said. Um, I teach a 90 minute intro to storytelling workshop and it's 90 minutes so that, because we all have short attention spans <laughs> and you can just get in and out and get a good, you know, solid foundation for it. And the people who are coming are, it's an amazing spectrum, actually, and I get really excited about it. Um, Some people are there because they do want to tell a story on stage, and they're Mm. just like, what's it all about? I want to know how to do that. Mm. Um, Some people want to know how to better do a PowerPoint presentation at work and how to put personal, um, how to make it more relatable to their, you know. Um, I've coached um, authors actually, who can read from their book and they're going on tour, but now they want to tell their story and they're too nervous about it or they don't know how when they've been writing fiction this whole time. Um, I'm in talks with a nonprofit right now who wants to know how to share their story um, so that donors understand why they Mm. should be giving them money (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, because they have a hard time just talking around. There's so many they, they get like so excited about all the myriad of reasons that they don't know how to make it a succinct focused. That, I think that is an industry problem for us, especially like talking about mm-hmm. the benefits of floating. We can talk for hours. It, it gets obscene. Like, Oh, we can do all these different things. And then pe- people tune out, you know, like how do we slice it down? Right. Well, you do multiple stories. It, perfect. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, keeping it focused and mm. streamlined with, 
bullet points. <laughs> and, and and that's another great idea for us is that we're trying to generate content year round, right? We're not trying to make a single PowerPoint presentation or a monthly PowerPoint presentation. We need to have a drip of content constantly. So when you say that, yeah, have a have have these bullet points and have it all these little little bits, that is good for us because that means we can use more and more uh, of that content over time. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know if this is necessarily your expertise, and Kim, this might be a question for you as well, but would, and although, I mean, you're on social media, you're very active on social media, so are, should these stories be recorded as posts? Should they be simply for the live feed that they, they're gone in 24 hours? Um, like if we're, if we're talking about our foot bath at the shop, is that worthy of a post or is that more of like a, ah, here's a little candid thing? How do I make that decision? Both of you at the same time, please, and go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see, uh, Reba, do you have anything to, to, to share on that? I do, but I've been talking yeah. a lot, so you go <laughs> first. <laughs> um, you know, I think there are different approaches to it, just like everything. There's a million ways to do it. Mm. And um, my general rule of thumb is that any kind of, like, stories or um, the, the sort of, like, time limit uh, types of posts – are typically things that are time sensitive, or maybe it's just a fun little behind mm. the scenes, um, something that you know you don't necessarily want people to have access to forever. Um, but it, it that's where you can really let a little extra personality show. You can also do that sort of thing in groups. If you have a Facebook group for your business, um, you can do that, which is what we typically do a lot of. Um, you can do a lot of different like in, interactive things in stories, like in like Instagram and Facebook stories, not just telling your story in a story <laughs> that gets a whole lot of wordy there. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't think there's ever necessarily a wrong way to do it. Okay. I, I just generally think time sensitive things you don't want living on your, your feed forever sure. because somebody might see that in you know, two weeks and suddenly your sale is gone, but they want to honor the deal and all of those sorts of, of things that, you know, can get in the way. So, yeah. Reba. What do you think, Reba? <laughs> I agree with that. And also, um, and I'm only really kind of speaking about Instagram right now because it seems like kids these days, but I don't know who's, you know, who's your demographic, actually. So um, I think that the fun behind the scenes, more vulnerable, get to know me kind of things are good for the stories, the, the Instagram stories. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I think, and that's where people are, cause it catches people's attention. That's what we're doing. We're, we, yeah, we're scrolling, but people in their stories, that's the huh. thing these days. And then keeping your feed very aesthetically pleasing. So you can get messy on your stories and do whatever, mm. and it's fun and just let it all hang out. It doesn't take a lot of time and you can shoot a quick video and you don't have to think too much about it. Um, but if you already have a really nice, beautiful feed, keeping it aesthetically pleasing because people who are coming to you for the first time, that's what attracts them. I feel like with like the visual before oh, the actual right. content itself, okay. and then they'll go up into your stories, but they're mm -hmm. going to see your feed first, but it's true about the time sensitivity as well. Good stuff. We are actually short on time here. Reba, is there anything that you want to leave with us or excuse me with our audience before, before we close up? Yeah, I would say just if you don't know where to start, just start either writing things down that come up into your head that you want people to know about you or that you are you don't think that they want to, but it's coming up for you. Mm -hmm. Or I'm a fan of recording into my phone using just my voice. I don't like to write. And just start shooting things out there. Start brainstorming ideas and things like just to get started. Um, and if you need help coaching, you can find me at mysteryboxshow.com or email me directly at reba.sparrow at gmail or on Instagram at happyapplepdx. Um, Perfect. Yeah, and that's where I'll be posting about upcoming workshops and things like that. Yay, awesome. Thank you so, so, so very much for joining us. Uh, you've definitely got my, my fires going here for wanting to create that content, so I, I really appreciate that. And I feel like more than just inspiration, I have some direction to actually go with it. So thank you very much. I truly hey, so appreciate welcome. you being here. Um, I'm going to 
ramble a little bit for, uh, for here about in, in closing and, and also give thanks to everybody. First of all, for everybody for listening. Uh, truly appreciate everybody lending their ears to the podcast. I should probably note that uh, Gloria will not be making it to this episode. So um, we'll see her in a couple of weeks here. <laughs> Um, we always announce uh, when a host isn't here at the end of the show uh, seems to be the case uh, thanks to everybody who is supporting us on Patreon you guys um, we were trying to get you super high quality images Reba is in last month's set, uh, last month's set so you know it's super high quality um, and there are just some really fun images like just pointing so you can put graphics there some some of the ooh, I, I, not cheese some of the hammier stuff um, that uh I guess I just haven't haven't done a whole lot of, and I've been really dying to, and pairing with Reba was just perfect. Um, but uh, yeah, here, also uh, video and um, blog, scientific blog posts as well. So just thanks for your support on the Patreon. And thanks to my co-hosts. Thank you guys so much. Thanks to Olga for producing the show. Thanks to me for editing the show. <laughs> and I think that's it. Um, let's see here. Until next time. You don't have to be perfect. You can be vulnerable and just put yourself out there. That's that's the way to do it, even if it's a little scary. We'll see you next week. I don't usually do that. That was dumb. That was that was cheese. That was some cheese. <laughs> <laughs> it's on me.